I was invited by Jeff to come and speak, I got very excited because as uh, was mentioned in my biography, I'm, I am an environmentalist at heart. I've been for a long, long time. And I work in G's Global Growth Organization, which was created about two and a half years ago by our chairman, uh, Jeff Immelt to foster growth outside of the U.S. and shift us from a 50-50 or, or even 60-40 business perspective uh, percentage-wise of business within the U.S., 60% uh, and 40% outside of the U.S., to something that is more akin to 40% or less business within the U.S. and 60% outside. And I would like, I try in my efforts to do that by fostering some of G's environmental technologies throughout this region, as I'll show you some examples of uh, shortly. I have a lot of content. I can go through it very quickly, um, which I will do uh, due to the time constraints. But I have uh, given this presentation to the organizers to provide soft copies to you all. And I would be happy to um, you know, have, you, have you take a look and ask me any questions later about it, if you, if you wish. So let me get started. Um, basically, let's look a little bit uh, macro basis um, on the, on the, the the situation in the global economy. So, you know, the population is expected to increase quite significantly over the next uh, several years, over the next decade or more. Um, the, global, the, the emerging uh, market countries, the, the, the developing world, is, is where a lot of growth is expected to occur economically, a lot of development. And with that development comes a press for additional resources that will be required to support the livelihoods as they increase in their income levels and, and just uh, the, the needs of the people as population increases. Now, the trends that we see in the near term, right, the, the slide before was kind of a long term, uh, the long term view of what to expect by 2025, roughly. In the near term, we see that, you know, there's some economic trends that are going on, such as the recovery of the U.S. economy, which is giving us some, some tailwinds, if you will, towards towards development, and then we still have some headwinds, right, some, some barriers or some challenges to overcome, such as the sustained uh, lack of recovery in the European economy, as well as, you know, high unemployment rates there and, and, and other instabilities we're seeing in parts of the world. So I just want to set the framework for what are the world dynamics that we, we face, right, as we look at how to leverage technology right, uh, as the first speaker mentioned, how technology and the private sector can be partners in a green economy. So some of the world dynamics that we see are obviously a need for reducing the CO2 emissions. We've, we've heard already from two speakers about the recently measured 400 ppm emissions levels, or CO2 levels. Um, tremendous fuel price volatility we've seen since the 2008 economic crisis. Um, the resource scarcity, as we know, for the growing population. And in light of that, we, we have aspects or levers that we can try to use to, to benefit the situation, right? Which is policy, policy uh, choices by government agencies and actors, and then uh, technology developments by predominantly the private sector, I would think, right? So, you know, by 2030, electricity demand is going to skyrocket, right? If we look, most of that increase is coming from the developing world because uh, today you know if you look at real figures and statistics let's take Myanmar as an example where the first speaker I think hails from uh, I went to several conferences there in the last year to talk about renewable energy development and and the needs of the country as I cover Myanmar uh, some sponsored by ADB and some poignant facts are you know they have a 26 to 28 percent electrification rate depending upon which figures you look at but the challenge there is that they have more than 70% of the population is rural. And it's very, very distributed. You have population clusters of only 300 families in villages, more than 6,000 villages spread throughout the country. How do you electrify that? It doesn't, each village's average household, or sorry, each village's average load demand is only 50 kilowatts. Now, you know, GE is one, is one of the largest manufacturers of power equipment in the world. We don't make 50 kilowatt equipment. Right? We make megawatt class equipment. The average power plant constructed in Thailand today is more than 900 megawatts. That is 900,000 kilowatts of production in one power plant. Each of these villages only has 50 kilowatts of demand, and they're many, many kilometers apart. So it would cost a tremendous amount of money, millions and millions and millions of dollars to build transmission network lines, 
around connecting these villages so that you could aggregate into significant load demand to put a power plant, and that would be very inefficient. So it beckons solutions around distributed power, and I'll touch on some of those later, using the resources that are available. We have to do things smarter, right? I know it's an ugly thing to talk about. I put a chart up here just to show the factors that we're facing, right? Oil demand is increasing, oil production is decreasing. How will that gap be filled, and are there intelligent ways we can work, recognizing that this may be the plan for status as quo, right? Status quo. How can we do something smarter to address this, right? Water scarcity is another key concern that we have to deal with, you know, as a society, right? 30% of the world's population is water stressed today, but that's going to double as a percentage by 2025 unless we do something dramatically different. If we look at specifically global water demand, it's very interesting how the first speaker mentioned efficiency of water usage in countries like, uh, you know, M Myanmar, Thailand, etc., right? The, the greater Mekong countries compared to what was implied, lack of efficiency of water usage in the West. But I think data tells the real tale, right? If you look at this chart, it's amazing. You know, how much water is, uh, I guess there's no pointer on this, how much water is used in the developing world per capita versus, you know, Mexico as a next door neighbor of the US. Look at this in water, u water usage, right? It's, it's incredible. Sure, there's a three to one factor of population in the US, but this consumption is, is very telling as to how, how we can be a bit wasteful as society develops and, and how we need to deal with this, right? So let me segue then into, into GE, uh, where I hail from, and, uh, and what we do, and what we're trying to do, and how we would like to be a part of the solution working with the actors present today. A weird company, uh, one of the oldest in, in uh, the U.S., more than 130 years old. We are present in most of the countries around the world. We have offices, more than 300,000 employees worldwide. We're a technology company. We provide technology in many different areas, uh, power, healthcare, aviation, uh, home, biz home and business solutions includes LED lighting. Uh, we have a financial services business, which is quite large as well, and we provide locomotives through our transportation business. We're very diverse. We, we generate uh, a pretty decent uh, chunk of revenues, and we redeploy a lot of these revenues to R&D in areas where we try to, to make an impact. Some of those, a lot of those, are, are uh, environmentally related. So one of the things we're trying to leverage our in-house R&D and knowledge, abilities uh, to do is try to solve some of the world's major challenging problems such as, as I've shown in the previous slides, renewable sources of clean energy and water availability. Now we do that through something some of you may have heard of which is our eco-imagination program where we invest uh, in trying to basically provide environmental performance in conjunction with operating performance. Because to be sustainable, one needs to be sustainable environmentally and financially, right? And so these solutions that are provided forth, that are researched and developed and promoted by actors from ADB, et cetera, all the way through Rockefeller Foundation, World Wildlife uh, you know, Foundation, these solutions that come out of academia and these circles, if they're not financially sustainable in and of themselves, they're not commercializable. And what does that mean? They're not scalable, right? So we try to find the solutions that can be scalable and deploy them quickly, right? So that you can have a significant scale of impact. Because that's what it will take when you have population figures and challenges this large. So, you know, uh, a closing comment on our economic imagination program is we really focus on, again, trying to work with customers to improve both operating and environmental performance through cost reduction and environmental footprint benefit. So enough about the general GE. Let me talk about some specific business segments where I think we can work together. I was excited about this because of, and conferences like this that I've attended over the last year and a half or two years in the region because they focus on opportunities for public-private partnership. Now there's a challenge. We do have to have a behavioral change if we want to look at dealing with public-private partnerships in an environmental context, because typically PPPs have always been large infrastructure projects, civil works. You know, when people think PPPs, they think of airport projects, tollway projects, bridge construction, right? Well, GE doesn't do civil works, right? Not, not of that scale. 
And those are difficult projects other than, you know, some interesting products around carbon neutral uh, cement or, or what have you. But, but in general, those are difficult projects where you can deploy cutting edge technologies that could be scaled later, right? They're more for mainstream technologies because of the scale of an airport project, or the scale of a, of a, of a large tollway project. So in the distributed power section, we, would, we have actually tried to do, and we're in the process of doing a PPP in Cambodia, which I'm gonna show you a little bit about. Let's talk basically, uh, or quickly on the distributed power opportunity. There's 1.4 billion people in the world without electricity today. That number <coughs> shifts as time goes on, right? Because the population is increasing. Um, electrification is a huge challenge. 85% of these people are in rural areas, right? So how do we, how do we deal with this challenge? Well, GE has a few different product lines. We have an aeroderivative product line, which is based on our aircraft engine business. We have redesigned aircraft engines to become fixed power plant uh, engines. Why would we do this? Well, aircraft engines have a lot of flexibility, which means as you start to electrify an area that doesn't have a lot of load demand, consistent, what we call base load, load demand, you need solutions that can be turned in on, on and off very quickly, so you don't waste a lot of fuel. And that is the design criteria for an aircraft engine. So it's helpful to take a product like that and convert it into a fixed land-based solution. So let me tell you about a case study we're working on right now, which is in Myanmar, as I mentioned, very low electrification rate, very old assets from pre-sanctioned times that are not very efficient, right? We're trying to work with the Myanmar government and come up with a solution package where we replace 25 old gas turbine assets that are more than 40 years old and they were not well maintained because of lack of access that the people had during the time of sanctions to adequate maintenance capabilities, right? So everybody recognizes the, the challenges that they faced and they did the best that they could with the resources they had available, but these assets are very inefficient, they burn a lot of gas, and they don't produce very much electricity. So we would like to upgrade those assets working with the government to repower, we have a repowered program where we, with, with a lot of experience, and we can save more than 20% of the gas used and still produce more than 10% uh, extra output. So that's a huge swing, right? You reduce the gas consumption more than 20% and you get an extra 10% output. You can do something else with that gas, generate more electricity or just monetize the, the efficiency benefit, right? And the government's priorities are doing it very quickly, doing it cost competitively, utilizing their existing assets as much as possible because they're cash and resource constrained, as we know, um, and using the existing gas supplies that they have available. So we, we have a solution that tries to do that. I, again, I won't go into details because of time, but the material is here and available if you'd like to look at it later, and I'll be around for questions. This is an example. We have a lot of experience doing that around the world, right, which we try to leverage here. We have gas engine products lines, which are reciprocating gas engines. Uh, they're, they're engines that are not turbines, right, but they still are used to generate electricity or provide compression. We have a Yenbacher business based in Austria and a Waukesha business that's based in the U.S. And uh, we also provide a solution for heat recovery generation, waste heat recovery, low temperature waste heat recovery generation, which is free fuel, basically just pure and uh, pure efficiency play, right? These solutions we're trying to use to generate cleaner renewable energy. And let me give you another case study, which is the pilot I mentioned that we're doing in Cambodia, where. What you see in ASEAN in general is a tremendous opportunity due to the amount of rice husk available, right? Rice husk is the waste res residue, the husk, from rice mill processing, right? So as in ASEAN you have tremendous rice production, right, for domestic consumption and export. You generate a lot of rice husk, which is waste biomass. Currently, uh, in places like Myanmar especially, it's not used today very productively. It could Sometimes it's used partially as a fertilizer, but it's not a great fertilizer due to high silica content and other things. It's a very low grade fertilizer, but you know, people use it for what they can, right? What we see is an opportunity because we have a solution with our gas engine technology and a gasifier uh, from uh, India, right? We have a solution where we can do this very cost effectively, produce electricity uh, on a scale that's small. It's single megawatt class or even several hundred kilowatts. You can't. Really? That fast, huh? Um, but uh, 
still deployable out in the field, right? Out in areas where they have significantly lower load demands than you see in places like Thailand. So Cambodia is an example. They have a lot of rice husk available because they export a lot of rice. Our solution involves taking that rice husk as a fuel source using a gasifier technology in one of our gas engines. And uh, we did it under a joint development model where we partnered with government. We found a local developer. We brought financing solutions. And we found um, enough off tough take for the load, for the, for the megawatts, to make it productive. So a rice mill uses it in the daytime. The people get the energy in the nighttime for lighting and other things they need for their livelihood. And we signed an agreement, and it's under construction this year. Um, we also have large utility scale renewable energy sources, such as wind. We're the largest wind turbine manufacturer in the world. Uh, and where technology comes into play here is, you know, that allows us to bring solutions to places like Thailand where you have very low wind speeds. Technology development enables solution uh, or solutions to be deployed in areas where previously you had winds that were too low to do wind power development. But now everybody is uh, developing new technologies that can be used. And that can power quite, quite a lot of homes, thousands and thousands of homes. And then finally, we have uh, water processing uh, technology solutions to address the water challenges I mentioned, ranging from desalinization plants all the way through uh, industrial wastewater and utility solutions to treat water because of the, the high stressor needs that we, we, we mentioned. I can go into more details on our water stuff, but I'm, I'm being given the, uh, the ax to, to get off of time here. So, Again, thank you very much for your time. I have some additional information and backup on how we do joint development of projects and how we would like to do PPPs. Please have a look, and uh, I welcome any questions or opportunities for further discussion. Thank you.